morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out and joining us this morning. Um, and special thanks to the Ibnarabi Society for uh, hosting this event and inviting me to do this. And many thanks to Farah uh, and the Abbasi program uh, for kind of bringing me back home. I lived here for your office was literally uh, right, right across the hall over there. So it's really nice to come back uh, and be back here, not just in the Bay Area or Stanford, but at the Abbasi program and, and in this building. So thank you so much for your hospitality um, and hosting us. Uh, so yeah, I wanna talk about love and love in Ibn Arabi. In the writings of, of, of Ibn Arabi, uh, most people like talking about love. It's a nice, it's a nice, thing, to, it's a nice thing to talk about. Uh, Ibn Arabi is no exception, uh, but he's, Ibn Arabi is not really known, uh, at least um, in, in the Anglophone world as a, as a big lover. Now, if you want to talk about love in the Sufi tradition, you usually think of Rumi, maybe think of Hafez, you know, something uh, about about those poets. But um, I, having spent some time reading Ibn Arabi, I think he's just as love obsessed as as these as these other Sufis um, and has some really profound insights. In fact, I think what I want to try to do today is it's less of a kind of standard lecture or talk, but a kind of exploration of certain passages and themes of love. So I'm going to try to do this like a um, seminar thing. So I'll just like ask questions and please respond. And if something I'm saying is not making sense, if you have a question, please. So I just want this to be an easy conversation as opposed to a lecture. There is a lecture I, I gave on uh, love and Ibn Arabi that's on the Ibn Arabi website. It's like 40 minutes long. So if you, you want to like listen to the, the lecture and there's lots of Henny Ibrahim and other people have great lectures on love, but I thought we could maybe try to have a more interactive uh, conversation. So what I'd like to do is I'll give kind of a brief intro to um, the kind of background of Ibn Arabi's love theory, I guess uh, you could say, the, the, the text he uses, the things he used to think about love, the way he thinks about love. And then I wanted to get into just reading uh, some things and trying to interpret them. And in the process of trying to interpret them and understand them, see how what insights that can yield for us about what Ibn Arabi has to say about love, but then also, you know, what does that tell us about the you know, reason I find Ibn Arabi interesting to read? It's not just historical, but I think it gives me insights into what love is, how I can be a better lover, a good lover, how should I respond to love, uh, and, and, and things like that. Uh, so as I've kind of been driving, I think to, Ibn Arabi is a tough uh, writer to understand in, in in some ways, but I think the angle of love is one of the best angles to go at to understand what Ibn Arabi is all about. So a lot of uh, other um, scholarship on Ibn Arabi will focus on big concepts like being um, or being or existence. Um, but I, I, having spent, the more time I spend with, with Ibn Arabi's writings, the more I, I think the, the best kind of entryway into this kind of vast universe of symbols and arguments and poetry is, 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 is really love. Uh, but even though love is great to talk about, it's hard to talk about. Um, so Ibn Arabi says, uh, he who defines love has not known it, and he who has not tasted it by drinking it down has not known it. So love is, you can't really define love. Um, it's something that can only really be known by experiencing it, by tasting it. And he says, not just tasting it, but drinking it down. It's not, you can't just get a little, you know, little, little, taste, of, little taste of love. You got you to gotta chug the thing to know what's going on. Ibn Arabi wrote also, I have a beloved whose name is the name of every beloved. And we'll explore what that means a bit more. One of my favorite quotes from him also about love is he says, um, and this is in the, Claude Adas uh, quoted this in one of her articles, by God, I feel so much love, it seems as though the skies would be rent asunder, the stars fall and the mountains move away if I burden them with it. Such is my experience of love. Uh, so Ibn Arabi was, was a lover. And in this quote, he's referring to a verse of the, the Quran about the amana, the trust. God says, we offer the trust to the heavens and the earth but they shied away from it, but man took it up. Uh, this trust has been interpreted in various different ways by different theologians as free will, as uh, the, being in charge of the earth, the khilafah. But for Ibn Arabi and a lot of other Sufi theorists, it's love. It's love. The amana, the trust is, is love. And the mountains and the heavens couldn't bear, would crush them. But as the uh, Quran says, the Ignorant, ignorant, foolish us took up, took up love. 
what's that what's that song uh, uh fools rush in all right well we couldn't help falling in love with god so we we rushed in and, and took up took up this love that would have crushed anything else okay so in ibn arabi uh this the kind of most of his discussions of love focus around two verses of the quran and three hadith three sayings of the prophet first verse that you'll see referenced in almost all Sufi discussions of love in one way or another is from Surah Ma'idah, and it says, whoever leaves his religion, God will bring a people whom he loves, and they love him. And then describes what these lovers are like. This, if not to be another Sufis talk about this, but one of the main things they, they bring out this is that the God's love is prior. He loves them. And then as a result of him loving them, God loving us, then we reflect that love back and then they love him. Now, as a result of this loving God then, so they love God, we love God. What do you do then if you love God? That's nice. Okay, I love God, but so what? Um, then the, the next verse of the Quran that's uh, discussed in virtually all Sufi writings about uh, love is uh, say, if you love God, say, oh, prophet, say to those people, if you love God, then follow me and God will love you. Right? So if you love God, what do you do? You follow the exemplary lover, wave the exemplary lover. And if you do that, then God will love you and forgive you all your sins. And so it's this nice virtuous circle of love. God loves us. So then we love him. What do you do if you love him? You follow his beloved in the way of loving him. And then he'll love you more. And you know, it's this nice round and round and round circle of love. Now, the three hadith, um, this hadith, Ibn Arabi probably talks about more than any other. Now, what happens when God loves you? Right, so God loves you, then it makes you love him, then you follow the prophet, then God loves you again. What happens then when, when you follow the prophet and become beloved of God? So Ibn Arabi takes us up in uh, many, 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 many places in this discussion of this wonderful hadith, the hadith of Nawafil, of supererogatory actions, devotions, which says, my servant keeps approaching me, by nothing I love more than the things I've made obligatory for him, prescribed for him. But he then continues to approach me with supererogatory, with extra works, until, uh, until or so that I love him. And when I love him, I am his hearing with which he hears, his sight by which he sees, his hand with which he takes hold, his foot by which he walks. Right? So God loves us, which makes us love God. And if we love God, then we follow the prophet doing all these uh, things that God's made obligatory and these extra things, we do that, then God loves us. Then when God loves us, he becomes our hands, our feet, our ears, our eyes, and it, it gets extended into a lot more. The interesting thing that Ibn Arabi takes pains to point out is it's not really God becomes our hearing and seeing. He says, I was all along your hearing and seeing. You re just realized that all along God was your, your hand. It's not just your, your very hand, your foot, your hearing. And, and 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 you're seeing and this for Ibn Arabi fulfills the kind of function of of creation uh, why is the world around why are we here why is this whole drama of love going on the answer is in a hadith that's non-canonical you don't find it in canonical sources but Sufis quote it all the time Ibn Arabi says he says it's uh it's not, uh, he, in a visionary experience, he asked the prophet about this hadith. And the prophet said, I didn't say that, but it's true. <laughs> so he says, so he says, Ibn Arabi says, I confirmed it by cash, by unveiling, not by rawaya, by, by, by transmission. So he continues to quote it with this. He's like, yeah, so the prophet, now I have it from the prophet directly, but it's not, you know. Um, and it's uh, this, the, the hadith of the, um, sometimes called the hadith of the hidden treasure, Kanz and Mahfi. But for Ibn Arabi, he quotes a different version of it. He insists that it's it's not hidden, because God can't be hidden. God is, uh, one of his names is Azahir, the manifest. Nothing is more apparent than God. So he says it's an uh, unrecognized treasure. Kuntu kansam lam or af. I was an unrecognized treasure, and I love to be recognized. So I created creation so that they recognize me. Or another way you could translate it, so by me, they recognize me. And so there's, he does a lot of interesting things with this, this hadith. But one of the things one of my teachers, James Morris, brought out about this was the, the connection between love and recognition. 
between love and 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 recognition here when uh and love part a part of love being wanting to be recognized and seen like in, in just ordinary human relationships you know, there's a big part of being in a loving relationship is feeling recognized feeling seen feeling understood and so there's this odd kind of poetic divine almost loneliness i want somebody to recognize me i want somebody to 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 yeah to to recognize me to see me to know who i am and if not to be in some places describes this in kind of more poetic mythological terms as a kind of divine loneliness longing to be recognized and in other places this describes it in a much more philosophical mode of uh god's knowledge of himself in himself is perfect but it's by virtue of being perfect in that way, it excludes imperfection, and thus it's imperfect. To be perfect, it must include all comprehensive, all inclusive, must include both perfection and imperfection. So what God needed in terms of this knowledge, in terms of knowledge to be perfect, would be the knowledge of himself in himself, as well as knowledge of himself as other or through another. Because the knowledge that you have of yourself through another thing is not like the knowledge you have of yourself in yourself. That's what he begins to fusus with. So it's like, so God put, made creation like a mirror so he could contemplate himself. Because right? even most, we can't see our eyes without a mirror. I mean, you can't see your face without a mirror. So you need a mirror in order to, 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 to see your face. So he said, God, in order for God to be God, in order for God to be God, uh, that is, in order for God to recognize himself, in order for him to see his own face, the creation had to come as a mirror. So that's the more kind of philosophical explanation of it. But there's a more uh, kind of mythopoetic one. It was like, God's lonely. He wants to be recognized. And so he, he he makes us so that we can recognize him through him and, 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 and by him. So he writes uh, in this regard, love is the principle or the origin of existence and its cause. It's the beginning of the world and it's what maintains it. And he says, interestingly, and this love is Muhammad. Is is the prophet, because um, this the 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 recognizer of God par excellence, the human being uh, that in which the divine names and qualities are represented par excellence for Ibn Arabi is is the prophet Muhammad, and for it is this is from this reality that this master the prophet uh, that the higher and the lower realities came came to be displayed. Um, so he um, okay yeah. Now, another um, hadith that comes up in Ibn Arabi's discussion of uh, love is the famous hadith, in Allah Jamil wa Yuhibu Jamal, God is beautiful and he loves beauty. And this is related to this whole God needing a mirror to, I don't know, shave or something like that, I don't know, to, to, see, him, to see himself. Um, Ibn Arabi describes creation manifestation as taking place through the name the beautiful. So it's kind of like God was an unrecognized beauty. And he wanted somebody to recognize his beauty. Uh, so he set up the mirror of, of creation in which he could contemplate his own beauty. And then those of, uh, those of us who, are, who exist in, in the world are like God's reflection in the mirror, looking back at him, recognizing him, his beauty, admiring his beauty. And beauty uh, is always followed by love. Wherever there's beauty, there's love. Beauty attracts love, like flies attract sugar, you know, vacuum attracts things that come into it. It's just love. Where there's love, there's where there's love, it's attached to beauty. Where there's beauty, love attaches to it. So God's beautiful. He displays his beauty in creation, in the mirror of creation, and in a certain sense falls in love with his own reflection. And then us, his reflection, we fall in love with him. So he writes, so the entire universe is beautiful and God loves beauty. Now, the one who loves beauty loves that which is beautiful. And the lover does not punish the beloved unless it's order to make him find ease or educate him. It says tomato here. Sorry, that, ignore that. <laughs> like, like a father with his child. Therefore, our final outcome will be God willing and was uh, well-being wherever we find ourselves. And here he's alluding to his verse. God is uh, wheresoever you find yourself. God is with you wherever you are. So this, this idea that the entire universe is beautiful because the entire universe is a manifestation of God's, it's basically just a reflection of God's beautiful face. So it's all beautiful. And so because it's all beautiful, God loves it. 
And because God loves it and God loves everything in the universe, if you love something, you don't torture it for no reason, at least not in, in other traditions, you know, Persian Ghazal traditions, yeah, the, the lover tortures, the beloved tortures you. Um, but in, in, in this context, uh, if you love someone, you love something, you don't torture it, you don't punish it. And if you make it go through pain and suffering, it's only for its own benefit. Right, so most of the time, you know, if I'm a good father, I don't shout at my son just to shout or because I'm tired or something. It's because I'm trying to train, I'm trying to lead him to a greater state of happiness whether short-term or long-term. So he says, based on this principle of creation through beauty and love attaching to beauty, the end of everyone and everything will be good. Will be good. Now, you know, some of us might need more lessons than others, getting there more time in the, more time in the timeout corner uh, <laughs> than others, but, um, but the, it, it all ends up, uh, as he says, our final outcome is good and well-being because all of creation is beautiful, God loves, what's beautiful in creation. And if you love something, you don't just torture it. So he explains this kind of, kind of more explicitly. That there's another group of people who will suffer the punishment of the next world in the fire in order to be purified. Then they'll receive mercy in the fire since providence made love come first. He's referring to this, uh, another hadith that my mercy precedes my wrath or is prior to or it has precedence over my wrath. Even though they don't come out of the fire, for uh, the love God has for his servants has no beginning or end. So Ibn Arabi doesn't say there's no fire, there's no, there's no suffering in the next life, but the suffering in the next life has an end. So people will stay, the way he describes it, people will stay in the fire, but the fire becomes coolness and pleasant and, and like a garden for them. So to kind of understand, summarize this again, go over this again, God wanted to be known he wanted to be recognized and so he set up creation like a like a mirror in front of him and we as people if not to be puns on the the word insan in arabic means both pupil and human beings so he says we as people we're like the the reflected pupil in the thing in in, in the reflection so if you hold a mirror in front of yourself you look at the the reflection you can see your own pupils there but if you look really closely in that pupil will be the, the entire image. You see your whole body, you'll see the, the whole everything in, in, in the pupil because it's through the pupil that the whole, if you close your eyes, there's no more vision, right? If the pupil is not there, there's no more vision. You don't even see the mirror anymore. There's, there's, there's nothing there anymore. So the pupils are that through which the whole thing kind of comes, comes, comes into being. And so we're that kind of reflected pupil looking back at God. So God looks at us and we're looking back at God. And God creates a reflection, uh, creates the mirror, has the reflection, manifests his beauty in the mirror of creation, falls in love with it. And then we, as the pupil reflecting back to God, are gazing back on God and falling in love with him as, as well too. Another way to think of this too, that I think gets at this central aspect of if there's no pupil, the whole image disappears is that of a dreamer and a dream. And this is my favorite one to explain because it captures a lot of what I think is going on with, with Ibn Arabi. So it's as if God goes to sleep and then has a dream. But in order for you to have a dream, you have to be in the dream. You got to be a character in the dream, right? So I go to sleep and I dream on um, whatever, LeBron James playing in NBA finals or something like that. If LeBron's not in the dream anymore, if I'm not in the dream, there's no more dream. It doesn't exist. LeBron is the character through which I experience the whole dream. But because LeBron is directly connected to my consciousness, everything in the whole dream world is in essence contained in him because it all comes from me. Right? So everything LeBron interacts with from a certain point of view, it's just me, the dreamer, uh, but it's also by that virtue, just him. Right. So LeBron is is me. So if not one of the verses of the Quran, if not we used to describe this, a verse that says, "You didn't throw when you threw, but God threw." So what if LeBron dunks on Steph Curry or something like that? You didn't. LeBron didn't dunk when he dunked, but I dunked. <laughs> right. I'm the I'm the dreamer. Right. So every, everything in the dream then is is both me sleeping, and also not me. And so this, what's going on here in terms of love then is that 
God dreams up this situation in which he wants to be recognized. You know, he, so he displays all of the beauty of his imagination in the dream. And then he's in the dream as well as his characters, as us. That's what people are. Where the eyes through which, this is what the hadith and waffle is, the hearing with which you hear, the sight by which you see, the hand by which, where the characters that God experiences the dream. Whether it's the playable characters in the video game. You no know, video games, you got non-playable characters and playable characters, right? So the playable characters, uh, the, we're the playable characters in the video game. So we're the characters that God's playing the video game through. And he's trying to recognize himself through us. He wants us to recognize and love him in that. And he's doing this out of his own love, ultimately for himself. Which is not separate from his love for us in this. So I hope that uh, I hope that makes makes some sense. Again, with a lot of stuff with Ibn Arabi, it's not he, he's not a linear writer or thinker. I mean, he'll be linear for maybe like two or three pages, and then pff, quick left turn, quick left turn. And this is uh, it's it's not accidental. This is intentional. So I I like to say that Ibn Arabi is an anti-systematic thinker okay. and writer. Because, uh, and he explains this in a couple different ways, but, but the basic idea is that any system that you set up, any conceptual constructs, God is beyond that. In fact, God is both beyond that and in that. But you can't limit God to any set of conceptual constructions, any schema, any doctrine. God's necessarily beyond that. Just by virtue of being God, he's beyond that. And so he's not trying to set up like a correct theory of everything. What he's trying to do is he'll argue through, take up any particular point, argue it through, show its limitations, break it down, and then argue from another point of view, take up another conceptual orientation, and argue that pretty far, break it down, then argue another perspective, and keep doing that. Because what he wants to do, in, in the way he describes it, is that the Arabic word for like doctrine or belief or creed is aqidah, and it comes from the root aqt, meaning not. And so he says, he's, he's trying to untie the knots. Knots are useful. They have, help you. You can get a handhold. You can do something, but you have to go beyond them. So he'll untie all of these different knottings, all of these different conceptual constructions, that ideas, concepts we have about God. Because he, he doesn't want you to have the right concepts about God. He wants you to realize. He wants you to have a direct experience of annihilation in realization of the reality of God beyond that which is mediated by concepts and words and uh, th things like that. So that's why I think Ibn Arabi is a bit more difficult to read than some other. Rumi is actually like this too, but he's more subtle about it. That's why I think he's, he's a bit difficult, particularly for academics to deal with, because we like having our concepts and our schemas. Of like, yes, this is what Ibn Arabi says about this. This is what Ibn Arabi says about that. But if you read a lot of Ibn Arabi, you know, at any topic, love, whatever, Ibn Arabi says like 50 different things, uh, you know, 20 of which completely are the opposite of 20 of the other ones, and the other 10 and really tough to figure out. So it's, it's. Um, but this, this I think is really, he's not just doing this because he's just writing crazily. Um, it's very intentional and serves a particular function and purpose. And if you go along for the ride, I think it's worth it. It's... So you might not come out, I mean, you may come out with a set of concepts and like, this is how to think about love, this is how to think, but that's not the point. The point isn't for you to have a better set of concepts. The point is for you to have a direct ex, uh, direct experience, direct realization of the realities he's alluding to and, 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 and talking about. Yeah, so this actually comes up in this la last quote I wanted to uh, bring up. Uh, so he says, when God provides someone with a love for him, that, his, that is like his love for that person, he bestows upon them witnessing and he gives him bliss through witnessing him in the forms of the things. Hence, God's lovers in the cosmos correspond to the pupil of the eye in the eye. Although the human being has many parts, nothing witnesses and sees save only his two eyes. Thus, the eye is like the lovers in, in, in the cosmos. So God bestows witnessing upon his lovers because he knows their love for him. This knowledge of his is a knowledge of tasting, a knowledge of experience, you know, so direct experience, so like 
I don't know, you taste guava or something like that. That's not, that's a not conceptual knowledge. It's a very different thing, like knowing the definition of a guava and eating a guava. And so when he's talking about this witnessing, it's not like, oh, yes, I have the correct doctrine about God. I know this is the nature of God. This is the God is wajib about wujud, the, the necessary being, or this is, no, it's, you taste God like a, like, like a guava. So his activity towards his lovers, God's activity towards his lovers, is the same as his activity towards himself, as he's interacting with his reflection. And that is nothing but witnessing uh, in the state of wujud, which you can try to say as being or consciousness, that is the beloved to the beloved. Right, so God sets up this whole mirror thing where the pupils in the eye, when we God sees that we love him, so he wants us to, to make us happy, so he gives us that which makes him happy, which is the sight of his own beauty. And that witnessing is not just a, you know, I get the correct set of categories, I get insights into the nature of reality, you know, I, I have my grand theory of everything, I can predict the results of experiments and things like that. No, it's a witness, like literally seeing, it's a direct experience. And that's the result of love. And that's, it's the witnessing is that of a beloved and a lover together. In, in terms of some some commentary on uh, these these verses that Ibn Arabi brings up, in in terms of the, this intensity of longing, right? So he he quotes a hadith saying a hadith Qudsi in which God is speaking on the, to the mouth of the prophet and says God says I am more intense in my yearning to meet my servant than he is in desiring me. Right? So as much however much we you know, want to meet God or love God as God is even more intense in yearning and longing for us. And there's a, one version of the Hadith and Wafal at the end says, you know, if, if you go towards God by a foot, he comes to you by, you know, uh, three meters or something like that. And if you go towards God walking, he comes to you running. So there's this idea that the intensity of yearning and longing that on the divine side is even greater, much greater than that on, on uh, our side, on, on the human side. And he has a lovely poem on this. He says, the lover longs for the sight of me, but stronger is my longing for him. The souls are impassioned, but the decree hinders. I moan my complaint and he moans his. So he's like, God, this is like uh, this Romeo and Juliet, Leila and Majnun kind of thing where God and us are these lovers who are longing for each other and God lo is longing for us even more. And we're trying to get together. But the decree, meaning like the decree of fate, time and decrease separation for at least a while. Now this is, yeah, so when he, he describes this experience of being in love with someone who loves you even more, but the, the one that you're in love with is kind of everything in a certain sense, nothing as uh, very bewildering. So he says, the, the one who defines love has not known it, and who is, he has not tasted it by drinking it down has, has not known it. So it's, it's something can only be known by experience. I mean, I can talk about this all day, but you're not really going to get it until you experience it. Now, in terms of drinking it down, he says, when you love him, when you love God, you know from the moment you drink the potion of his love for you, that your love for him is the same as his love for you. Right, so from the moment you you taste the you, you experience God's love for you, you know that your love for Him is the same as His love for you. And this potion, this drink, intoxicates you so much that you forget your love for Him, even though you feel that you love Him. So He says, so just give up trying to distinguish between these two kinds of love: your love for God, God's love for you. It's like once you once you drink it. So it's, it, it induces a kind of drunkenness. You kind of love drunk. And you get so love drunk, you even forget that, that you love him. So he's like, so just stop trying to distinguish your love for God, God's love for you. It's the same thing. But this is a kind of bewildering, confusing, drunken state, uh, which if any of you guys have been like really, really in love, that's, it's, it can be bewildering, confusing. There's a reason why people are, in poetry and other things compare love and drunkenness. You're not, I think even at the, going back to my old neuroscience days, your brain chemistry is very different when you're in love. You do things that you would not ordinarily do. You think in strange ways. You do strange things. Uh, it's, a, it's a different mode of being. Now, he, he says then the subtlest thing that you might find in love 
is an excessive passion, a longing, an agitated yearning, a passion, a wasting away, an inability to sleep or total pleasure or take pleasure in food all the while that you know you don't know who it is or how it is that you love and your beloved doesn't become specified for you. Specified. You don't know who you're like crazy in love. You can't sleep. You can't drink. You can't eat. You're, I don't know if you ever experienced this for another person. It happened to me once. It was, yeah. So it was wild. I couldn't sleep. I knew food lost its taste. I was just kind of wandering around this crazy love days. But so Ibn Arya says, you can be like the, the subtlest thing you'll find in love is this really, really intense love and passion, but you don't even know who it is you're loving. So yeah, as we're kind of seeing this love, and Ibn Arya points out, love is always, you want union with something, right? If you're in love, that's what love leads to union. You see something beautiful, you want to keep seeing it or get closer to it or you know causes an inclination and attraction you want to move towards it you want to be united with it even something like oh, you love uh cake or something like that you see the cake you want ah, i want union with the cake right so love leads to union but union is an, union is an interesting thing because union is there's no longer like once i eat the cake the cake is me and i'm the cake right there's not there's no longer this that union, that kind of direct experience, that tasting, there's, and not just tasting, he says drinking it down, swallowing it, right? There's no longer a distinction between me and the cake, the cake and me. And, and, and so it becomes confusing and bewildering because the cake is no longer like an object that I can desire and go after. And that I can be like, there's cake there. You know, once, once I've swallowed it, there's no, you know, without getting really messy, separating me from the cake, <laughs> the, the cake, the, the, the cake, the cake from me. Um, and so what, what's me loving and what's the, is the cake loving me? If I'm eating it and I'm enjoying it and part of me is cake and it gets, you know, it, it's very bewildering and, and confusing. And so union leads to most of our thinking is premised upon a subject object dichotomy, nowhere known, thinker thoughts, and you know, these, these kinds of things. Union effaces that uh, distinction. That, that relative distinction. And so it's bewildering. You can't think norm the way in which we normally think doesn't apply in that situation. And so it's bewildering. But this bewilderment is itself a kind of knowledge, right? You know the taste of cake when you eat it. You know what it, if, it, if it's good, if it makes you feel good, it doesn't make you feel good. You, you know cake intimately well when you eat it. So from one point of view, it's a kind of bewilderment that destroys ordinary relations of knowledge. But another one is it's knowledge itself. That's what knowledge is really all about. He has this really paradoxical thing where he points out, you only love things you don't have, right? Or you use the word desire, it might be easier in English, right? So if I want the cake, I desire the cake, right? It means I don't have the cake. And he says, once you eat the cake, right? Or once you get the thing you desire, if your desire continues, it's what you do, the object of your desire switches to the continuance of that relationship, which is also not present with you. Right, you want the next moment, you want the next moment, you want the next moment. Right. So he says, so love is always attached to non that which is non-existent. Right? So he says, this is why how why love is the reason for existence. God, who is all existence, all consciousness, all being, is love is attached to non-existence and keeps bringing things into existence, keeps bringing us into existence. Mm -hmm. And so love is all you always want what you don't have. Once you have it, you're not like you want it anymore. Or another way to think of it might be a little easier to get there. It's like you can't seek something that you already have, that you know you already have. If you're seeking something, it's because you don't have it. It's because it's out there. But then this leads to a paradoxical conclusion. Uh, he says, well, if that's the case, you can't love God. Because God could never be non -existent. God is existence itself. God is conscious, you know. So he he just like, it's like you can't seek God. There are a lot of, a lot of great poems. It's like, where did God go? That you're seeking him where did god get lost that you're that you're looking for him right god is anima tawalu fatamu wherever you turn there's a face of god god is uh everywhere god is in everything or god rather is everything from a certain point of view so it's not like god could be somewhere you can't seek god now, where did he go that you that he's absent that you that you uh 
right? So he says, so from this point of view, you can't love God because love is always attached to non-existence. God can't be non-existent ever. So he says, what, what you love then is you love knowledge of God, which is impossible because uh, in, in Arabic, the, no, the definition of knowledge is, uh, or not Arabic, in certain schools of Islamic philosophy, the surrounding encompassment of the known by the knower. The Quran precisely says God in, in Ayat al-Qursi, nothing encompasses. You can't encompass God. God is the all-encompassing. You can't encompass God. So you can't know, you can't ever know God. So knowledge of God is non-existent. So you love that and you keep seeking more and more and more knowledge and witnessing of 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 of, of God. So so Ibn Arabi kind of paradoxically, like he says, says you can't ever you can't love God. Uh, because God could love always attaches itself to non-existence. God can't be non-existent. Um, you can't seek God because what does it mean to seek that which is present with you always? Um, but what you can seek is your witnessing, your awareness, your knowledge of that. But that's ultimately just seeking your own happiness. So he says everybody's just kind of trying to make themselves happy. And you can't actually seek God. But in typical bewildering fashion, then he'll flip it as we'll see again later. And because again, going with the dreamer, the dream analogy, let's say, I don't know, Steph Curry falls in love with Aisha Curry in the dream. I dream, I'm, I dream I'm Steph Curry. I fall in love with Aisha, right? Who am I really loving if I'm loving Aisha in the, unbeknownst to Steph, he's being catfished by me, <laughs> the, the dreamer, right? He's actually in love with me. I'm appearing as Steph Curry and I'm appearing as Aisha and I'm loving myself through them. So if that, first, Ibn I will take it like, God can't be loved. It's impossible to love God. And he's like, yeah, only God is ever loved in anything. And only God is the lover in, in anything as, as well, too. Right? And hopefully, this kind of, you could call it a dialectic or whatever he's doing. You can see how both are right. Um, so if you follow, follow this. And this is, this is bewildering. God can't, on the one hand, God can't be loved at all. On the other hand, only God is loved. And then I added this extra point, which is why Ibn Arabi introduces almost all of his big ideas and arguments with poetry. And he does that because what, what, what poetry does um, is through its beauty, through its forms, it's uh, elusive. It's pointing to things rather than trying to tie things down and put things into particular uh, it, this is this, this is that. It's synthetic rather than analytic. And so the way Ibn, a lot of Ibn Arabi's writings work is there'll be a short poem that kind of summarizes what's going to follow. Then he'll spell it out in long, 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 long prose and all kinds of arguments. That basically serves as a commentary. To, he and other Sufi writers, um, uh, Saadat bin Hamouye and others do this really, they, they turn, in a certain sense, turn language against itself. If we understand language and the kind of ordinary use of of, of language, or they envision, they use language in a different kind of way to go beyond the, the ways in which we normally think about language. It, it, it can be. That on the other hand, though, Ibn Arabi says that poetry, this poetic use of language, says that's that's the substance of language and prose is the accident. So what the, the real, the real, what's really going on with language is this poetic use full of ambiguity, full of opening things up to different possibilities, that's the that's the substance of of of, of language and prose. Quran is yeah. Quran is not poetry, but it it's in, in, intensely intensely poetic. The way in which Ibn Arabi describes good poetry, he says the Quran is the uh, of combining the beauty of form and beauty of meaning and maximum possible meaning in like minimal space. He says Quran is the best example of this. The Quran is, even though it's not poetry, in a certain sense, it kind of transcends the category of poetry, but poetry is the closest approximation to the Quranic language. So Ibn Arabi says that that uh, poetry is uh, really good for ijmal, to kind of things, bring things together, giving a big picture mm -hmm. of things, synthesis, and um, uh, prose and these other things are good for kind of the, the, the opposite of that specification specification dividing up this thing from that thing this thing from that thing but if your if the worldview is one grounded in tawhid in divine unity um what later people called wahdat al wujud reality is ambiguous is united and which is one of the reasons i think he he leans on poetry so much to express his uh, his vision
But I was going to say, speaking of the poetry, I wanted to make sure we had a chance to to read this one, which is in uh, his famous collection, Tarjuman al Ashwaq, The Interpreter of Desires, which Michael Sells is a great translation out now, the, the translator of Desires. So I'll, I'll read it and then uh, read my my own kind of version of the translation. It's a little different from Professor Sells because I, I, I like my stuff to rhyme or sound like the original. Leita shi'ari hal darao. Ay yaqalbin malaku. Wa fu'adi law dara. Ay shi'bin salaku. Atarahum salimu. Amtarahum halaku. Hara albabul. Hara arbabul hawa. Fil hawa wartabaku. So you can hear it. it's got a nice, it's got a nice sound to it. So this is my translation. Oh, so I should tell the, the backstory of this. So Ibn Arabi was in around the, in Mecca, around the Kaaba, circumambulating with the pilgrims. And then he had this idea for these verses, and he stepped a little bit to the side and he started reciting them. So he recited these verses and he was kind of pleased with them, got a nice little sound. And then he said he felt a hand as soft as silk tap him on the shoulder. And it was this woman named Qurat al Ain who had her own critiques of these verses. So the, the verses are, I wish I knew if they knew which heart they have taken to, and my heart would that it knew which trail they have taken off to. Do you see them safe and sound or think they've drowned and perished too? The lords of love are bewildered in love and caught up in it too. All right, so Qurat al Ain, it's a nice, nice little poem. And the, 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 the setting here is this, this idea of the it's drawing on a lot of motifs of classical uh, Arabic Arabic poetry, in which lovers meet up at the Kaaba, lovers meet up in, because uh, pilgrimage, you know, all these tribes are coming from all over the place. So if you're in love with, you know, whatever, let's say your, your, your girl is in the tribe that lives in LA or whatever, but you guys meet up every year for Burning Man, or, mm -hmm. you know, then you, you go there and the tribes are everybody's getting together and that's that's where you can meet your girl and you know and so you 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 he's 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 drawing on this and then he's saying then when you leave though when when people disperse there's this heart sick longing and that's when a lot of poetry is from this at the moment of pilgrimage when the beloved's departing or when you see the the remains of the campsite of your beloved and so he's he's drawing on this so he's like i um and he's the the plural here in the arabic poetic tradition is like the the tribe of the beloved woman so their tribe so he's saying i wish i knew if if they knew which heart they ta they've taken so i wish I, do do does my beloved you know does her tribe know that they're going back home with my heart they know that they've they've carried off my heart and i my heart my heart wishes that it knew which way they've gone which trail they've 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 taken and are my, he's kind of asking his heart or asking his friend next to him, do you think they're safe and sound? Do you think they're okay? Or do you think they're perished? Or it's like worried uh, about them. And then he says, the lords of love, this big, uh, big term, they're bewildered in love. So the lords of love are the people who would be, you know, the masters that are the masters of love, but they're bewildered in love. So the people who are the masters of love are themselves by love, but mastered by love. And what tabaku ensnared, uh, like they're like caught in a trap, and in, in they're, they're caught up in love as well too. So it's this kind of wonderful reversal of. So that that's what that's what that one means, and I think it connects a lot of these themes of love, knowledge, and bewilderment. But Qurat al Ain had her own critique of this, and um, she was like, "What do you mean? You're supposed to be a great knower. You're supposed to be a great arif. How can you say you you don't know? How can how can you say you don't know this?" What are you talking about here? And then at the trail of the heart, you know, being that if the beloved is God and the God's trail to the heart, she says, that's dealing with the divine essence and that's that's beyond knowledge. So you, why are you you're showing your ignorance here by even asking about this God's connection to the heart? That's beyond uh, your knowledge. And then do you think they're safe and sound? Are you asking if God is safe and sound? What are you, doing? What are you talking about okay. here? This, and then the lords of love are bewildered in love. And then here she says, if you were a real lover, there wouldn't be anything left of you to be bewildered. So she, line by line, she's like, nope, 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 nope. I'm surprised. You're supposed to be a big, you know, Sufi enlightened person, and you're talking like this. And nobody was like, oh, okay. She called it bin Ami, like, okay, my cousin, like, thank you. You know, you're you're right. And then asked to know a bit more about her. And uh, yeah, so they had this 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 exchange, which. Many people think that this woman, Qurat al-Ain, was also Nidam, 
who was the woman who we've met and inspired this whole collection of poetry in which this 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 appears. Um, so anyway, so in this poem about bewilderment, which he's already writing about bewilderment, then Qurat al-Ain comes and bewilders him even, even more. It's like, if you're saying you're bewildered, that means there's still a you that's like, well, kind of, if you're a real lover, you're completely gone in your beloved. All right, so she adds bewilderment to bewilderment. Yeah, uh, his, it might be a literary device because there is a literary trope of poets and scholars uh, making arguments and then a young woman, usually of low social background, but not all, exclusively, coming and correcting them. So it's a, it's a trope in Arabic literature of the jariya, some big scholar, some big arif, some big Sufi, some big somebody, say, holding forth at, in front of the Kaaba in Mecca, and then a uh, young slave woman, servant woman, woman of uh, poor background or unlearned woman coming and putting them in their place. So it's a, it's a, it's a kind of literary trope, which Ibn Arabi was undoubtedly playing with here, but, and whether it actually historically happened or not, I don't know. So there's another famous collection of prayers in the Prophet, the Lal Khairat. It's probably the most, one of the most popular pieces of Islamic literature like ever produced everywhere. It's like in Nigeria, Indonesia, everywhere. It's the story of how it came about was there was this Sheikh Al Jazuli, big Moroccan Sheikh, who went to a well and there wasn't a rope to pull up the bucket. So he was looking around and said, "Anybody help me like get this water from the well?" And the little girl, there was a little girl there who was like, "I thought you were a Sheikh. Can't you just get up?" And, you know, he said, uh, no, no, I can't. She said, all right, I'll help you. And then calls up the bucket, comes up full of water. And then she's like, how, he was like, how do you do this? And she's like, man, you're really like, I'm really disappointed in you. I thought you were a sheikh. She's like, I just, I send salawat on the prophet, these prayers and blessings of peace on the prophet all the time. So I can, you know, they, because I obey God and sending blessing prayers on the prophet, his creation obeys me. And so Jazuli was like, oh, wow. And so that's the frame story he gives for the composition of this Dalal Khara, this massive collection of prayers in the Prophet. It's been divided up into different days of the week that's just recited throughout the Muslim world. But this is, this is the same thing of somebody who you think would not have knowledge, who you think would not be advanced, coming and schooling the person who, now how much this is a literary trope about things about knowledge, how much we're historical, I don't know. Okay, so moving on to, uh, on, on to bewilderment. So Ibn Arabi cites a hadith that um, I haven't really seen outside of Ibn Arabi and people inspired by Ibn Arabi, but I love it. It's, my Lord, increase me in bewilderment in you, which parallels the verse of the Quran, say, Rabbi zidni elman, say, God, increase me in knowledge. So just by the parallel structure, this is implying, as we've already kind of talked about, a connection, even a unity between bewilderment and knowledge. And in, in his uh, in his Fusus, in his Bezels of Wisdom, in a chapter on Nuh, on Noah, when he describes those drowned, he does his own interesting reading of that. He says they're drowned in the ocean, which is which the knowledge of God is, and which is bewilderment. So he's even more explicitly in here, he says, the knowledge of God is bewilderment. Uh, then elsewhere, he, he writes that it's the purpose of divine guidance to lead humankind to bewilderment. Now this in, in Arabic is pretty strike because usually rushed, dalal, like the huda, guidance is something that's, it's it, it doesn't get you lost. It's the opposite of being lost, right? Guidance gets you, it's the GPS that gets you, you know, if the GPS is working right, if the map's working right, you don't end up the world, you don't end up out in the wilderness, right? But he says, it's rather, it's the purpose of guidance to lead people to bewilderment so that they learn the divine order itself, as you asked, is entirely bewilderment. Um, there are different ways you can interpret that, but anyway, he says, and thus there's nothing but bewilderment, shattering one's vision. This is in, in the Fusus as well, uh, in the chapter on Moses. Although the one who knows what we are saying will not be bewildered. So he's saying what's really going on, there's nothing but bewilderment, which is literally shattering your vision. Your another your your conceptions you think it breaks it, but the one who knows what we're talking about won't be bewildered about this. He'll know that everything is bewilderment. Everything is just this breaking of. Um, all right, so he says I'll try to get through bewilderment quickly if we can. Bewilderment is instability, kalak, and movement, haraka, and movement is life. So there's no rest and no death. There's only being without non-being. So bewilderment is all. Motion, it's perpetual motion. So I also, I think poetry works well for bewilderment because every time you read a poem, 
you can get a new fresh meaning from it that's one of the great things about poetry so it's 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 motion and movements life so it's all life it's all being there's no rest there's no death and this is the very structure of being of, of reality it says the bewilderment of the arif the knower in the divine side is the greatest of bewilderments so the knower is most bewildered um, the greatest of bewilderments is the bewilderment of the knower uh, about the knowledge of the the divine side since he stands outside this knower stands outside of restriction and delimitation this knower who is bewildered possesses all forms, yet no form delimits him. This is why the messenger of God used to say, God, increase my bewilderment, increase me in bewilderment in you, increase my bewilderment in thee. For this is the highest station, the clearest vision, the nearest rank, the most brilliant locus of manifestation, and the most exemplary path. So what he's talking here is like this one contains all forms, but is not limited by any of them, just like God contains all forms, contains everything, yet is not limited by any of them. He even says in another place, this is the, the highest level of Sufis. He talks about the folk of Allah, the Ahlullah. They're God's people and his property flows uh, out on them. And his property is this precisely this non-delimitation, not being bound by any particular form. Um, so another way uh, he describes it is Sufi manuals. They talk about these different stations or stages, maqams. You go in this maqam, and then you get work, you get to another maqam, then you get work, you get to the other maqam. And each maqam is characterized or delimited by certain feats. So if you're in the maqam of tawbah, you're repenting, you're repentant, you have these kinds of things, and then you leave that maqam and go to another maqam on your spiritual journey. So Ibn Arabi says the highest station is the station of no station. Maqam, la maqam, because if you're in a maqam, if you're in a station, you're delimited and restricted by that station. Right? So it's it's you're still limited. The best thing is to be to be able to flow through all of them and not be limited by any of them. So uh, one place I described it, it's like um it's not like in terms of color, right? You're not like trying to get to purple or something. It's not like karate belts where it's like, ah, I've got the black belt on, you know, I'm now Mr. Master Sufi. Um, uh, rather, it's uh, the, the, the goal, what's, what he sees as really the goal is kind of becoming clear, like water, so you can take on all colors. So it's not achieving the best, the highest form, the highest level of coloration, but it's rather transcending form itself. And the transcend form means being able to take on any form. It's like Bruce Lee's be like water, my friend, put water into the cup, becomes a cup, put water into a bowl, it becomes the bowl. Right, so by being able to take on any form, the water transcends form, form and color. Um, and so he said, that's, that's, what, that's what this is all about, because God himself uh, is transcends form. He's in all forms. He's, all forms are in him, rather, but he transcends all forms. And so if you want to get like God, you want to get close to God, this is what you have to do. Now you do that, you know, through going through the forms, but you're not limited by to any of them, by any of them. And so this is perpetual flux. Uh, that's precisely bewildering. That's why this Iranian film, The Color of God, which actually comes from something in Atar, which comes from a verse in the Quran, Sibratullah, refers to this. What's the color of God? Well, it's nothing. And because it's nothing, it's everything. It's all colors. So he describes this instead of, um, I think this really, this, this passage really helps understand, or help me understand what he's talking about. So he says, for the bewildered one, this is from the Fusus, the, it's orbits and orbital motions around a center, he, which he never leaves. But the man of the long path, uh, by contrast, is oriented away from uh, the goal, seeking after what is within himself, a companion of his imagination and the fantasy that he's made his own end. So the person of the long path has a from and a to and everything that lies in between, right? So if you're like, I'm seeking this great Sufi station, I want to be an Arif, I want to be a Sufi master, I want to be, you, there's a from and a to, here and the from and a to, and it's everything in between. So this is not the, the path of the bewildered people, the path of the bewildered people is a circle. No beginning, no end, you're just going round and round and round, the, the center, which is the divine essence and just appreciating the difference manifestations of that at different angles at every moment so it's always different it's in perpetual motion but in another sense it's never different because it's just you're still in the orbit versus the standard way of conceptualizing the path as like there's a from i'm starting out here there's a place where i'm trying to get to and 
you know, he said, there's a from and a to, and there's distance and there's separation and there's the journey there. But he said that to that you've put, that's just a creation of your own fantasy. So he says, for bewilderment, you're in orbit. Now for us, uh, you know, just from our sides, experientially, it'll feel more like, you know, attaining escape velocity and then going into orbit, you know, like a satellite or something, because most of us, life based our we, like you said most of us even our ordinary language is based on this from two i want this it's over there i go get that i have to get on a plane to get here and come here i need to earn money so i go do the you know it's a, from two thinking is the, the the long path that's kind of how most of this works but there's a what ibn arabi i think is trying to move towards is to move from this way of being in, in most cases to this circular orbit kind of this this bewilderment so he says the the person of orbital motion this bewildered person which he he calls a muhammadan because he said this is the highest level of saints this is what the prophet was like has no beginning which would allow a from to attach itself to him so he's got no there's no to and from in a circle it's just and he has no end which would allow a two to have any control over him so again to and from delimit you right so if you got a to and a from then you're limited by what your goal is you're like I'm going to be an investment banker, and then your your possibilities, who you are, this is delimited by that goal. But the the orbiting person does not have those same kinds of limitations. He's possessed of the most complete existence, and is bestowed with the all comprehensive words and wisdom. It's a reference to the prophet is described as having jawamil kalam, all of the words and hikam, all of the wisdoms, which were what led them to be drowned in the sea which is the knowledge of God is, and which is bewilderment. Right, going back to the, you know, we talked about Noah. Um, now again, because there's no to and from, there's another nice poem he has here, which uh, illustrates this paradox of uh, uh, longing for something which you already have. Um, so he says, how strange that I yearn for them, again, the plural here, uh, and longing ask about them while they're with me. My eyes weep for them, but they're in the very blackness of my eyes in my pupil my size long for them while they're between my ribs and so i don't even think that needs commentary I think that's, this is it's clearer than anything i could say so ibn Arabi's stepson and disciple hunawi describes his own experience of realizing this right because it's cool to hear Ibn Arabi, but it's nice for somebody to be like okay this is what is to be one of these you know orbiting people what's that actually like Pretty cool. This is from Chidik's article, which is, if you're interested in this idea, Chidik has a great article, uh, Station of uh, the Central Point, uh, which is all about this. And so Chidik quotes Punawi, and Punawi says, the tasting of the perfect human beings has affirmed that everything is in everything. Nothing has any stability, uh, essential stability, in something from which it cannot change. On the contrary, everything is on the verge of being transformed into something else. This is a situation of all wujud well-being, all consciousness. This constant flow is the divine journey from the first non unseen to the realm of the visible. Nobody experiences this journey and reaches its source except he whose essence has come to be non-delimited. So if you, if you get there, then the bonds are loosened. The contingent properties, states, attributes, stations, configurations, acts, and beliefs. He's not confined by any of them. By his essence, he flows in everything, just as wujud, being a consciousness, flows in the realities of all things without end or beginning. And I says, when the real gave me to witness this tremendous place of witnessing, I saw its possessor has no fixed entity and no entity. So it's like, you realize it's you, like, it's kind of, I don't know, Taoist, Tao Te Ching or Shuangzi or something like that, these descriptions of flowing through everything, being through everything in perpetual flux and transformation and having no fixed entity. No fixed entity. So for Kunui, and, and, and I don't know if any of you guys have read Kunui. Kunui is all of, he's very, very logical, very, very philosophical, very, but for Kunui to realize human perfection is to realize it's not a particular thing. It's the realization of being no particular thing. This is the contrast with the long path. But in a certain sense, just like the Hadith uh, Nawafil, you do all these actions, you do all these extra things, and then something happens, perspective shift, and you realize it was God all along. It was God, it's the hand, it God's your foot. So there's a shift from one point of view. And from another point of view, it's like, oh, this is what's always like. Rumi has a poem, years I knocked at the door, it opened, I've been knocking from the inside. 
So there's a difference, there's a shift, perspective shift that happens. So there's a real kind of, in a certain sense, a from and a to, but the two that you get to is there's no more from and to, you, you're kind of already there. But you can't just, it, it's not just, oh, I'm already here, I can just sit here and chill, that's fine. It was whether, I, whether I realize it or not, I'm running, I'm still doing these from and to things. But there's a, uh, he's kind of saying there are things you can do, there's a path you can follow that will then take you beyond paths. And you realize you're there all along. Um, um, all right, so Ibn Arabi writes, that which man uh, preserves in his heart is only his belief. That's what he embraces of his Lord. So if you examine, know whom it is that you examine. You will never leave yourself. This is what we we're saying uh, before. And you will never know any but your own essence. Since the temporally originated thing becomes connected, never becomes connected to anything but that which corresponds to it. So if you're temporally originated, if you exist in time, you can never connect to anything that's eternal. You just connect to other things that are, that are in time. Um, and that's what you have of him. What you have is temporally originated, so you'll never depart from your own kind. In reality, you worship nothing but what you've set up in yourself. That is why doctrines concerning God are diverse and the states change. One group says he's like this. Another group says he's not like that. He's like this. A third group says concerning knowledge, the water takes on the color of its cup. It's from the same from Junaid. Lon al-ma, lon al inai like we talked about. The third position holds that the cup affects the proof, thus affecting him in the view of the eye. So consider the bewilderment that pervades every believer. The perfect human being, however, is he whose bewilderment has intensified and his regret is continuous. He doesn't reach his goal because of that which, because that, because of that which is his object of worship. For he strives to achieve that which cannot possibly be achieved and he threads the path of him whose path is not known. Him who is more perfect than the perfect is he who believes every belief concerning him. He recognizes him in faith, in proofs, and even in heresy, ilhad, since ilhad is to deviate from one belief to another specific belief. So he describes this moving between different beliefs, seeing God from different perspectives as heresy, kind of shockingly, because of the etymological meaning of ilhad, of heresy, to move from one belief to another. So he said, so if you want your eye to hit the mark, witness him with every eye where he pervades all things through self-disclosure. In every form he has a face and in every knower a state. So examine if you will or do not examine. All right, so there's a lot, I mean, I think we covered a lot of this already before, but I wanna leave with this, this, this bewilderment is again, if we go back to the dream metaphor, I, I dream that uh, the NBA finals or something like that. And if you really want to understand me, you have to know, you will have to see and understand me through all of the eyes of all of the characters in the NBA, my dream characters in all the NBA finals, because that's all me. And each of them are delimited perspectives I'm taking on myself, right? So again, Steph Curry sees what LeBron doesn't see and the guy in the stand sees what the janitor there doesn't see. And they're all delimited perspectives on myself, but it's all perspectives on myself. So if you need to, if you want to know me in my totality, you need to know me through the eyes of all of the characters in the dream, because they're all particular delimitations of me. It's nothing but me. It's nothing but me knowing me, but through all of these delimitations. And so to know me in a non-delimited fashion is to be able to recognize me in, not just when you see those people in the dream and be like, oh yeah, that's, these are characters in a dream, but also be able to recognize what they're seeing and what they're thinking as also me as well and this is bewildering because they all contradict each other i think that's a good place we'll come back and talk about desire and then come back to our verses to see if, if they've changed them